All right, we're going to get going. If the times that you have requested to speak are correct, we should be done by 11.15. If we run seriously over that, we do have other hearings today that people travel here for. We will recess this one to the end of the day, which will make it about 3 o'clock. So <laughs> brevity is encouraged. If we go long, you're going to have to hang around for the day to come back at the end. Um, pro tips for folks testifying, try not to repeat what you've already heard. Bring something new to the conversation. That's the value of having multiple speakers. All right. So having said that, let's get this going. Welcome, Representative Mullion. Said it wrong. You're up. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Smith and honorable members of this committee. Thank you for allowing me to introduce House Bill uh, 1259 relative to passenger restraints. For the record, I am Representative Mary Jane Mulligan serving Grafton District 12, towns of Hanover and Lyme. Now, as many of you may already be aware, New Hampshire is the only state in the country without a law requiring seatbelt use by adults. And I would like you to know that I did pass out a copy of the uh, testimony. Um, so it's the only state in the country without a law requiring seatbelt use by adults. Many believe that this is something to be proud of. In fact, uh, there is nothing to be proud of because not having an adult seatbelt law translates to New Hampshire having the lowest seatbelt usage rate and the highest unbelted fatality rate of any state. Now, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the national average for belt usage is over 90%. And 19 states have belt usage rates that are higher than this 90%. The data also shows that New Hampshire's belt usage rate was only 67.6% in 2017, and this is actually a decline from the 70.2% usage in 2016. According to the New Hampshire Department of Safety, 136 people died on our roadways in motor vehicle crashes in 2016. 97 of them were in vehicles <coughs> equipped with seatbelts. Unfortunately, 71 people who died, or 73% of them, were not using their seatbelts. This 73% unbelted fatality rate is the highest in the entire country and significantly higher than the national average of 41%. Now, we have a higher percentage of people dying in motor vehicle crashes because they are unbelted than any other state. Now, the same is true for life-changing injuries such as traumatic brain and spinal cord injuries. Increased seat use, belt, uh, seat belt use, has proven to decrease the number of deaths and injuries in every state that has passed seat belt legislation. Data from states with primary laws shows a larger decrease in deaths and injuries than states with only secondary laws. Supporting data shows that seat belt laws are necessary because many of us deceive ourselves into believing that it will never happen to us and therefore choose to not take advantage of the seat belt's safety functionality. The reality is that the 136 people who died here in New Hampshire in those mostly preventable crashes during 2016 were average people people like you and people like me. Wives, husbands, mothers, fathers, children, somebody's loved one. I am sponsoring uh, House Bill 1259 because no seat belt legislation has been introduced in New Hampshire since 2009. And because many of my friends and constituents did not realize that New Hampshire didn't have a seat belt law for adults. Many of these folks moved here from other states where seat belt use for all was mandatory. And so they naturally assumed it was also true here in New Hampshire. Now, once I sponsored the bill, I started asking people if they wore seat belts or if they knew of anyone who didn't wear seat belts. I met quite a few people 
who didn't wear a seatbelt or who knew someone who didn't. Now these people told me that their reasons for not wearing seatbelts were, one, that they were too lazy, or two, the seatbelts were uncomfortable. Those were their words. Now interestingly, not one person mentioned anything about not wearing seat belts because of our state motto, live free or die. It was only when I asked some of the state legislators here in the state house about seat belt use that I would hear the live free or die argument as their reason for opposing legislation requiring adults to wear seat belts. Now I ask you, who doesn't want to live free? I believe that we all do. I know I do. And I also believe, though, that one group or one philosophy shouldn't define what living me free means for the rest of us, especially when the cost is so many lost lives or people with life-changing injuries. I believe that we can create positive change by joining the other 49 states with seat belt laws that have been proven to minimize risk of death and injury, that would be good for our society as a whole, and that has been proven to have a positive impact on the public health crises without losing any of our personal freedoms. Just think of all the various highway safety laws that we currently abide by for the common good. We have been doing this for so many years, yet we are still remaining to be free. Again, thank you Chairman Smith and honorable members of this committee for permitting me to testify in support of House Bill 1259. And I respectfully ask the committee to find this bill worthy of your support with an ought to pass recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from the committee? All right, thank you. Thank you. And so it isn't a big shock to the folks here to testify. If you have asked for four and you're still going at four, I'm going to let you know you hit that so that we can keep this thing on the rails. Next up, Bill Allen. I do hate this, and it may be just a little bit longer than four. My name is Bill Allen, and I'm here today because my autonomy is yet again under siege. Certainly this applies to so many relentless attempts to impose overreaching legislation on ostensibly free individuals, but I'm just applying it to this one today. Who should have authority to control our lives, the individual or the state? I contend this is hardly a trivial matter in a country founded on fragile individual liberty. Yet history and ever-expanding law books clearly show us that every successive generation is habituated to incrementally less freedom. Surely, even the bill supporters would concede that this won't be the end of their social engineering. There will always be just one more incursion on the fundamental concepts of individual liberty and personal responsibility. For our own good, of course. What these supporters can't or won't grasp, however, is that our own good is also our own business. It concerns me greatly that far too many, including legislators and bureaucrats, as we're gonna hear, as we have already heard today, don't fully appreciate or respect these concepts in today. Nevertheless, the founders still assure me that I need not worry about having to surrender them for myself. That is a fact. In the Constitutional Republic, rights do trump the majority. I'm not here to argue against the efficacy of seatbelts. That's an issue for education, not legislation, however. That's an issue, um, uh, that's an issue for education, not legislation, not government force. All the personal stories and statistics you're going to hear today are surely heartrending, and certainly delivering bad news is incredibly hard. But these aspects are completely irrelevant to the fundamental fact 
that we each have a right to make our own choices, and yes, even our own mistakes, even if the statistics aren't quite what we'd like to see. That's how a free society works. You've already heard the argument, basically, but Dad, all the other states are doing it. To me, the obvious response is, where in these United States, in this land of the free, does one go, can one rely on anymore to escape government meddling? Proudly, it has been New Hampshire. But this bill seeks to eliminate the very last refuge on this issue, the last of 50, the final extinction of seatbelt self-government. There will be nowhere left to retreat for those who would dare claim the temerity to make their own decision, whatever that might be. Is that really necessary? Must the spirit of self-determination be eliminated everywhere? Must New Hampshire also embrace paternalism? Is there absolutely no room for limited government in even the smallest corner of this country anymore? We are Borg. And ominously, what similar personal decisions shall we surrender to the state next for the good of the collective? There are indeed virtually infinite right candidates, many affecting this committee's own private lives, I have precious little doubt, and only live free or die hypocrisy needed to regulate them all. I did not elect representatives to sell out my liberty for the return of a few pieces of my own silver. I also did not elect domineering mommies and daddies. The growing micromanagement of my life must stop. Despite what proponents of this bill seem to believe, I am a sapient legal adult, not a child to be molded by the state. Please tell me right now, here for the record, if you contend otherwise. I do not consent. I reject government's authority to presume to protect me from myself. I require that my government respect my decisions and instead protect me from those who would, through the force of intrusive government, impose upon me their will, their view of how I should run, live my life, what risks I should be allowed to take. No, it is my life, not my neighbor's. And significantly, it's my neighbor's life, not mine. In closing, government can't make life safe, and laws do not stop crime. They merely define it. And this bill would thus merely define a whole new class of nonviolent criminals worthy of state aggression who never asked for the state's help in the first place. Please stop government's unauthorized and unwelcome behavior modification experiments. Please defend vanishing first principles. Kindly retain our New Hampshire culture of individual liberty and personal responsibility and reject the insidious insatiable and un-American nanny state, and only its latest onslaught in the form of HB 1259. Thank you. Questions from the committee? All right, thank you. David Henderson. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Before you, before you start, additional cards coming in now will most likely be heard at 3 p.m. today. Go ahead. Great, thank you. My name is David Henderson. I'm the Executive Director for the National Safety Council of Northern New England, based here in Concord, New Hampshire. We're a provider of defensive driver training in the region. We offer the state-approved point reduction program. We also do a lot with hosting driver education classes. And we also do a lot with uh, companies and businesses regarding their safe driving practices. Uh, I'm not going to repeat some of the statistics that were, that were shared earlier, uh, but I do want to make a couple points. First of all, we've known for many years that wearing a seatbelt can reduce your chance of dying in a car crash by 45% and of serious injury by 50%. This is why 34 states have already passed primary seatbelt bills, including Maine, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. There's a report, the latest crash statistic from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, which will be shared. I know some of the points will be shared later. But there's, this report outlines two major facts. One is, as seatbelt usage goes up, unrestrained passenger fatalities go down. And secondly, states with primary seatbelt laws have a higher rate of seatbelt usage 
than states with weaker enforcement measures. Now, from these facts, it's, and these are facts, it's clear to me that people are dying unnecessarily here in the state of New Hampshire every single year, only because we do not have a seatbelt bill, a seatbelt law. Estimates of the number of lives saved by this bill annually may vary each year and it could be debated, but even, even one death can be presented, it could be prevented because of this bill. It makes the passage of the bill the right thing to do, particularly if that one person who passes away is not a statistic, it's somebody we know. Remember that the state of New Hampshire already recognizes the significance of seatbelt usage by requiring everyone under the age of 18 to wear a seatbelt. So this bill would not really be establishing a new law, but in essence would be raising the age limit on a law to wear seatbelts that's already in place. Finally, to be clear, I don't believe this bill is about government interference, personal <coughs> rights, or living free and dying, since driving in the state of New Hampshire is a privilege, not a right as proven by the fact that you have to take a test to receive a license, and if you are found driving unsafe, that right to drive can be taken away or suspended. Um, this bill is ultimately about only one thing, and that is public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, being on this committee a long time, I do remember hearing this before, and, and it's, you know, never came to fruition. But part of the Apple off it was state highway funding. And I think New Hampshire could have got $7 million if you passed a seatbelt restraint law. Mm -hmm. Is that still available from the feds that your organization knows? I have no idea. I have not heard that. I know there probably will be some speakers later. Um, but this, this uh, support that I offer to this bill uh, is irregardless of a funding or not. It just, uh, my experience is it, it will be something that will save lives and also it'll save, it'll save dollars as well because a lot of people who choose not to wear seatbelts uh, do cause other taxpayers to increase or to incur costs through health care. When people get hurt, it's passed on talk to the taxpayer, so there is a cost to, to not having such a bill. Representative Sykes, and if it's a question about what the feds may or may not do, I believe they're here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll let the experts address that. It is excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Are you aware of any research where a person who chooses to be unbelted, traveling in a passenger vehicle with people who are belted, who then become involved in a crash and then become a projectile within the the enclosure of the protected car. Are you, are you aware of any statistics and can you point us in the direction of where we might find that? I do know there are those statistics available. I do not have them here as part of my testimony. However, I can acquire those, those details. I do know I have seen videos of people basically as projectiles both inside of vehicles and also being projected through windshields into traffic uh, as traffic's moving. But I can't cite any specific facts to you today. But we can get that information for you. The airbags failed to deploy, or was it a really, really old vehicle? Again, I don't know. I, I can't okay, cite I, any specific. So you're, you're characterizing someone being projected through the windshield, and I know in my 94 Oldsmobile that wouldn't happen because the airbag would deploy and did when we were in an accident. Right. So, okay. Other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's the organization? The National Safety Council of Northern New England. We're a local chapter of the National Safety Council, and we've actually been providing driver education since the 1960s. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for This morning, I'm going to make it short and sweet. I don't repeat everything everybody's saying. Um, I believe, like the gentleman earlier, that this is about personal freedom. I don't think there's a lot of argument that yes, seat belts do sometimes save lives. I personally have two friends that were killed because they could not get out of seat belts growing up in the South. I also believe that cars nowadays, most of them, all of the new ones, have seat belts, they have airbags. So we already are kind of being forced, I know my cars beep if I don't wear the seat belt and if you put them behind you, that's uncomfortable too. 
So I'm not arguing that there are seatbelts and there are laws for that. I just believe that there should be the right to choose whether or not you wear a seatbelt. Um, and again, I think that people, you don't hear statistics today. You know, something that you said too, you never hear the statistics of the person that couldn't get out the seatbelt or the person that had other issues. My own stepdaughter would have been impaled had she been in a seatbelt. So maybe that's one in a million, but it's still one like the other accidents. So I believe that I'm in opposition of being told I have to wear a seatbelt because of personal freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? All right. Stacey Savage. Good morning. My name is Stacey Savage. I'm from New Hampshire Emergency Nurses Association. I'm an emergency department nurse and have been for over 20 years. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Emergency Nurses Association as well as myself. Um, in New Hampshire and across the nation, we are in the front lines of caring for um, the pain and suffering of people who are involved in motor vehicle crashes. Um, <clears throat> when I was a child, it was never a question whether or not we wore a seatbelt. My father at the age of 13 was involved in a car accident. He was projected in the, um, out of the car. Two other people in the car died. He lost his eye as well as the use of his arm. So it was never a question in my household whether or not we wore seatbelts. I moved to the state of New Hampshire and was shocked as I worked in the emergency department to find out that people don't wear seatbelts in New Hampshire. Never once in the thousands of trauma victims that I cared for have they said to me, gee, I'm glad I didn't wear my seatbelt. Um, I think some of our opponents as we've listened in this room have spoken against freedom. Um, you've never been at the bedside to tell a 12 year old that a father died because he chose not to wear a seatbelt. I'm sure that while he was involved in that crash, he was not thinking, gee, I wish I, I'm so glad I didn't wear my seatbelt. I'm sure he did not want his 12 year old daughter to be told that he died because he made that decision. Stop making us tell people and children that their parents have made this decision not to wear a seatbelt. There's no other state in this great nation that gives us the right to say that we don't want to wear a seatbelt. Why does New Hampshire? Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Uh, yes. In your experience of treating yeah. patients and everything, uh, you brought up the airbags, but my 35 years of the fire department, yeah. can you confirm the facts that going through the windshield is not the only way that you could get tossed Absolutely. out of the base Absolutely. So vehicle, if you're not wearing correct? a seatbelt and an airbag deployed, you could be injured by the airbag. And I've seen it thousands of times. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, for follow-up then? No. Very okay. good. No, no, right. I'm biting my own self. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> Representative Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and I'll be very brief. Uh, for starters, what happened to my body, my choice argument? This is a, this is literally an issue of freedom. It does not directly affect anybody. People are going to bring up stats all day. Uh, the fact is, tyranny is our front door, and I use that word on purpose. That is exactly what they're attempting to do: is force a seatbelt law on us and to try and nanny us and to try and tell us what's good and bad for us and the whole bit. It's ridiculous. Uh, I, I couldn't even believe my eyes when I saw this bill come forward. So uh, do not pass this bill. We all have the freedom of, to, of choice and to choose whether or not we want to wear a seatbelt. And um, frankly, I think some of the uh, arguments are quite nonsense. Uh, you, know, you talk about people going, be it projectiles through windshield. I like the stats on that. Uh, that's absolutely ridiculous. So in any case, don't pass this bill at all. It's terrible. Please kill it. <laughs> Thank you. Sue Princess. Okay. I was out of Oregon. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm Representative Timothy Horgan, Representative Stratford County District 6 of the towns of Durham and Madbury. So I think this is a good bill, which is uh, 
not a uh, not a uh, not an infringement on liberty. On but I'm a my body, my choice type. I'm a uh, pro-choice person. If you bought it on my um, so I've, I mean, I'm, I'm used to wearing my seatbelt. I personally would find it as unnatural to be without a seatbelt and driving my car as it would be to try, drive on the left side. And so do I drive on the right side of the road just because it's against the law to do so? No, although I try to obey at least most rules of the road. I mean, um, you know, do I move over to the left side of the road when there's no oncoming traffic or there's no police around to see it? No, it's a state infringing on my freedom. I'm when it tells me to stay on the right side of the road. Well, no, not at all. So I think this is, um, one of those places the state has every right to make the rules and enforce them. Although I do understand that being in your car it feels like a very private thing, even though it's a public act and it, it affects um, everybody else on the road. So I think wearing your seatbelts is basic as staying on the right side of the road. In fact, it's even more basic because some countries drive on the left side of the road and that's just as safe. But even there, you still have to wear your seatbelts. So, um, and as I guess I, my written testimony talked about the fact that your odds of survival are much better when you. Uh, when you buckle up and your odds of being conscious and mobile during the wreck go up, go up a great deal. And that means you can uh, control your car better. You can help the other drivers and first responders deal with the uh, emergency. You know, even during the wreck, you can control the car better if you're belted in behind the wheel rather than being tossed around inside the car or even worse ejected from the car. And that, um, that can happen um, even with airbags and uh, modern windshields. So it does happen all the time. You probably, uh, you can pick up the newspaper almost every day and there's a report of uh, somebody, usually a young person, tragically died and they usually say, if they say they're injected from the car, you can be fairly certain they were not wearing their seatbelt when they did it. And on the other hand, people can survive quite, uh, quite horrendous crashes um, relatively unscathed if they are wearing their, their seatbelt. So we're going, we're going to be regaled with stories concerning people who trapped in the wreckage of their car. Um, we, you've heard a story about a uh, woman somebody who would have gotten impaled if she had had her seatbelt on, I don't know. And you know, cars do plunge into bodies of water, they do even catch on fire. And when that sort of thing happens, you don't want to be trapped in your car and it, it, <coughs> it takes a split second to um, reach down and unfasten your belt. And, um, if, and if the first responders come, they know how to cut off the belts too. So I guess you know, they, can, they, can, they, can, you know, they can cut out, cut away the sheet metal to get to somebody in a wrecked car, they can cut your belt while they're doing it too. That's not a problem. So I, this bill is a perennial bill for whatever reason it hasn't come back to the 2009 session. But um, and ironically, she was unable to be here and it's, I don't want to go into too much because it's her story rather than mine to tell, but the prime sponsor that year's bill got into a very, very bad accident in 2009. That was pretty much the worst case scenario. She was driving a small car, a uh, man, driving a much larger van hit her and she was wearing her seat belt, her car and <coughs> she was uh, seriously injured but two days after the crash she was able to be on the Channel 9 News and give an interview and um, the other driver, if I talk correctly, even though he's driving a large van and had all that metal which people, large vehicles are so proud of, he was actually killed in the accident. So I, would, so I say this is a common sense bill and, um, and you, sh you, sh you should pass it. Thank you. Okay, thank you too far in two minutes. That's why I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused on, on some of the uh, particulars of the bill. Yeah. Um, if, I, uh, if I've got a bunch of my friends with me, I must ensure that they have their seatbelts on. But if I'm driving for Uber, my friends don't have to wear a seatbelt. I wonder why, why is that? Um, Exception put into, into, into the bill. Well, you're, you're, you're going to have an executive session. You probably just get the more detail about it. Uber, Uber is a, essentially the same thing as a taxi, even though the existing laws of taxis don't fully apply to it. So that's, uh, and of course, on the other hand, there are Uber has its own regulations, and they may, um, I don't know what the details are. Never even having taken an Uber yet, let alone been an Uber driver. But that's, uh, you know, that's that's something you look at. That's something you can. Uh, that's something you might want to think about if you're executing the bill, but that's, uh, but traditionally, um, traditionally taxis and limousines and like um, the passengers aren't required to be belted. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Representative Dan Hines, representing the town of Merrimack. For the record, I don't wear my seatbelt. I think it's a personal choice, and it does go into my mind that I have the right in New Hampshire not to do it. I think that we're the last state, only state in the country that doesn't do it. That's even more of a reason for us to continue not to do it. We shouldn't be following what the other states do. Live for your die has been mentioned numerous times, and I think it's most applicable to this bill. This issue is actually one of the most important issues for me. It's part of the reason I moved to the state. So while some of you might want to get rid of me and go against the bill, um, I suggest that live free or die, it's right on our license plate. It couldn't be more applicable to this issue. Live free without the government forcing you to do something in your vehicle or die if you make the wrong choice and you're unfortunately in an accident. It's, it's just, we're weighing odds here. I accept the risk that there's a possibility I could get in an accident and be more seriously hurt without a seatbelt on but I'm willing to take that risk. Uh, there's nothing preventing people from wearing seatbelts. Educate people all you want, tell them the statistics, show them gruesome pictures of people being in accidents, maybe they'll change their mind. But ultimately, that is their choice. I'm pro-choice when it comes to seatbelts, whether you should wear them or not. I would similarly oppose any bill requiring people not to wear seatbelts. I think they're the exact same issues, it's just the government picking winners and losers, which I suggest we shouldn't be doing. Um, this bill, if passed, it would just give police another reason to stop people. They already have so many reasons. This is just one more reason. Um, we don't need to give police more reasons to stop people. Frankly, I, it might deter some people. It's certainly not going to deter, deter everyone. I still would continue to not wear a seatbelt, even if this law punished me with a fine of $25 or whatever it is. Um, someone made the argument driving is a privilege, and even one death is worth it. If we take that rationale, I could solve 99.99% .99 of fatalities on the road. All you'd have to do is reduce the speed limit to five miles per hour. That would essentially eliminate all fatalities. We don't do that, obviously, for numerous reasons, even though driving's a privilege. So we can't just weigh things like that. I suggest when we're weighing against someone's liberty, their liberty should come first. And finally, the point I'd like to make is I equate this to medical treatment. So if I go into a hospital and they're telling me, look, you have to do this. If you don't do it, there's a very good chance you would die. I have the right to refuse that. It's called against medical, um, whatever the AMA is. But I suggest it's my body, my choice. I'm accepting this risk, and that's how it should be. I ask you to preserve, live free or die, and I feel this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you disable the bell buzzer on your? I do. So. Is that a lot of trouble. Yeah. No. So my car had. If I don't have it, it either blinks or there's a red light that really distracts me that I hate. So what I did is you can buy a seatbelt extender. I put that in the seatbelt thing just so I do not have to see a blinking light that is distracting me while I'm driving. Further questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. And this could be the first name that I mangled today. Adam Rendis. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, my name is Adam. Um, I am representing myself today. I'm a trauma manager at one of the largest hospitals in the state. Um, and as uh, I realize this bill does not have uh, bipartisan support, um, but even as a Republican, I, I fully believe that this needs to transcend party lines. Um, obviously, a lot has already been stated this morning about the uh, efficacy of um, seatbelts and reducing fatalities. So basically what I have to bring to the table to you is local data. Um, every trauma center maintains their own database, so what we were able to do is pull data about seatbelt use from a local instead of hearing it on the national level. Um, in our area, only 33% of people involved in car accidents are wearing their seatbelt. 78% of those patients uh, that died in motor vehicle accidents were not wearing a seatbelt. And uh, as the opposition has sat here and talked about the um, right to not have government impose laws on them, um, I can get behind that if only one person is affected. However, many of us are affected by this. Um, from 2014 hospital billing, these are only Medicaid patients in the state of New Hampshire in our region. Uh, restrained billing was 605,000. Billing to unrestrained passengers uh, that were involved in crashes, just hospital charges, was 1.79 million. So there is a large billing problem that um, one person decides 
to not wear their seatbelt, but the rest of us in the state are affected. Um, that's basically what I have, I have to offer you today. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, thanks for taking my question. Probably the first one I asked this. Of the, stati the statistics you mentioned, the 78% uh, of the people that died in a crash were not wearing the seatbelt, I believe is what you said. Yeah. Does that separate out the reasons for the crashes in the first place, whether it be speed, alcohol, distraction? I mean, does that statistic show the rest of the data? So that, that number is the total of motor vehicle crash fatalities. <coughs> All right. I would start. Good morning, folks. I have been a governor appointed member of the state's traffic safety commission for the last 15 years. I am also the highway safety specialist at Dartmouth and have been with them for about 10 years and everything I do there is education based. I also work for the New Hampshire Traffic Safety Institute and for the last 17 years have taught the National Safety Council Defensive Driving Attitude course some 650 times. In the pro and I'm here today representing the New Hampshire Traffic Safety Institute and myself um, based on what I've learned from the teaching of the Driving Attitude course. I've learned a lot. And one of the biggest things that I consistently hear and believe is that we deceive ourselves into thinking that we will never be the individual who causes a crash, nor will we ever be in a crash. And therefore, we convince ourselves that it's not necessary to wear a seatbelt. And the driving experience itself builds on that. Because what really happens is we drive week after week, month after month, year after year, and we're not in a crash. So we come to believe that, guess what, I'll never be in a crash. It just reinforces what we are starting to think. And that is so false, because at some point, the crash is going to, the crash is going to happen. And it happens to people like you and me all of the time. There's just no, no doubt about that. We lost 136 people in, two, in 2016. Nationally, we lost 35,461 people that was an increase of about five and a half percent. The problem has been with us ever since automobiles, motor vehicles have been with us. It's not gonna go away. The vehicles we are driving, anything fairly new, Representative Smith, you, you mentioned the contrast of newer versus older. Obviously, anything that seven, eight, nine years of age is by far safer than the early, my first vehicle in 1963, Dodge Dart, for example. And we, we have to take advantage of that. And the seatbelt becomes the primary safety device in the vehicle. If we are in a crash, or when we are in a crash, and we are not restrained, we end up being projected, either inside the vehicle, tossed around, or out of the vehicle. And I want to show you a couple of video clips that are real crashes that were filmed when they happened, and I'll explain that as we look at each of them. The first one, is from a company called DriveCam. They sell cameras that commercial companies will put in their vehicles so that if a crash event occurs and there's any legal action, they know what their driver did at the time. And I want to show you this because you're going to see the driver fall asleep. He is going to then leave the driver's seat. He's going to go into the front passenger seat and from there he's going to go spread eagle into the back seat. So let's show you that, and then we'll discuss that just a little bit more. So I show this video clip in every driving attitude course that I teach. And at this point, I asked the question, I asked this for the folks, would you agree with me that he's a good-sized man? Because many of us believe that if we're big enough, strong enough, we can hold ourselves into position. He's a 250-pound-plus man. And you saw, did you see, that he went into the front passenger seat and then spread eagle in the back. So when we talk about personal freedom and the idea that I have the right to decide what happens to my body, 
The reality is that motor vehicle crashes may only involve us, but as often as not, they involve others. If someone else had been sitting in that front passenger seat, might he have hurt them? If someone else was in the back seat, the small child, for example, might he have hurt them? Might he have killed them? We're really good about restraining our small children. We're not so good about restraining ourselves. And then when a crash event like that one happens, we do become that projectile that harms or kills someone else. So we, it's, it's not just about us. It's about everybody that is in our vehicle. It's everybody we share the road with. Driving is a social behavior. We have a responsibility to ourselves and we have a responsibility to everybody else that is on the road with us at the time that we are. So now I want to show you the second clip. Again, this was, this was filmed by a helicopter. Um, I don't know the reasons. This driver is driving at excessive speed. Representative Walsh, you asked about causes of crashes as they relate. Excessive speed is one of the top three, has been for years. So you're gonna see him clip another vehicle and then as his vehicle rolls, he's going to become ejected out of the vehicle. Watch closely. There he goes. You see him? So he actually flies over five lanes of traffic the breakdown lanes, the median strip, into the path of oncoming traffic. You watched all of the other drivers trying to avoid that body flying suddenly through the air. It affects other people. The individual that went over his body, and my understanding, my belief is that the driver in the second clip was dead when he hit the pavement, but the one other vehicle did go over him. Other vehicles had to swerve to get around and putting themselves at added risk. The individual that went over his body didn't kill him. But picture yourself being in that scenario and going home at night and putting your head on the pillow, trying to get a good night's sleep. What are you gonna see? What are you gonna feel? You're gonna hear the thump, thump, thump of that person's body underneath your vehicle. And again, I stress, if seatbelts were only about us and we were the only one at risk of being harmed, then yeah, maybe I would buy into the argument, and I do believe in personal freedoms. I've been protecting them all of my life. I think back to when my mother first told me to get my hands out of the cookie jar. I did everything I could to always just resist that and go after that next cookie. The fact is, there's, there's got to be a balance between what is right for us as individuals and what is right for the society of which we're a part. And these videos, uh, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, I think these are worth 10,000. We do have the lowest seatbelt usage rate in the country. It has been declining for the last two years. We continue to have the highest unbelted fatality rate. We therefore continue to have high medical expenses. You know, when you say it, 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 it's all right if I want to die, it's all right if I want to be injured. What about your family now that's impacted financially? What about your family that has to take care of you for the rest of their lives? What about the society that's put in your hill? That has to be part of our conversation. There's no way around it. You will hear the stories like you heard earlier about the individual who was harmed because of the seatbelt. Yes, that does happen about six tenths of one percent of the time. Seatbelts, like every other safety feature in a modern day vehicle, have become better than they were when they were first installed in vehicles back in 1968. Today's seatbelt is a very different seatbelt. The risks of being harmed by the belt are very, very rare. We just can't ignore the fact that what's happened in 49 other states is as they have passed the laws. You're, you're a little more than double the time you asked for. All right, I asked so for time. Wrap it, okay, okay, I'll wrap it up. But the fact is, it, it is a it's, a, it's a social problem, it's a big problem. It's one that we can make the decision to make go away of only we pass this law. Questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for taking my question. What does your agency, if anything, or do you know of education in the state? You mentioned that the voluntary usage is declining. Are there any steps for promoting it? Uh, 
education was? We had we have tried for years, even before I became involved. Um, this has been a, a constant part of the conversation. That is how we got ourselves even to the 67, 70 percent. 72.2 was our highest percentage a few years back. And education works to a certain extent, and it has worked to a certain extent. But many, I, I do surveys of the folks in my driving attitude courses, and I ask about would they support, would they, would they resist a seatbelt law. And the fact is that many of them say, I will only start wearing a seatbelt when I'm told that I have to do it. There's just that certain population, the 32% or so that regularly don't buckle up, many of them will only do it if it's mandated on them. Thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here to represent the National Transportation Safety Board. The NTSB is a federal agency charged by Congress with investigating crashes in all modes of transportation finding out their probable cause and then making recommendations to ensure that they don't happen again. We see firsthand the tragic results of highway crashes, which cause over 90% of all transportation-related deaths in this country. Since 1968, the NTSB has issued more than 150 safety recommendations related to seatbelts, from the way they're designed to their availability in vehicles, um, improvements to the technology, primary seatbelt laws, education, and high visibility enforcement. On March 26, 2010, a team of our investigators arrived at the scene of a crash in Kentucky involving a truck semi-trailer that struck a 15-passenger van. The truck driver, van driver, and nine van passengers died in the crash. Two children in the van who were secured in child safety seats survived with only minor injuries. Three van passengers were ejected and three other adult passengers came to rest behind the front passenger seat of the vehicle. None of them were wearing seatbelts. At the time of this crash, Kentucky's law did not require van occupants to use the available seatbelts. So quite simply, Kentucky's law didn't provide adequate protection for everyone in the vehicle. This crash is not an isolated event as we've heard um, already today. And by the end of today, 100 people will have lost their lives and thousands more will have been injured in traffic crashes, many simply because they didn't wear their seatbelt. Proper seatbelt use is your single greatest defense against injury and death in the event of a crash. That is why we have recommended that all states enact a primary seatbelt law that applies to all passengers in all vehicles that are equipped with seatbelts. We all know that seatbelts save lives, but I had no idea until well into my career at NTSB that mine would be saved by one as well. In April 2001, I left the office early for a dental appointment and, uh, and then to pick up my son from kindergarten. On the way to that appointment, I was involved in a high-speed crash. I was airlifted from the scene to a local <coughs> trauma center, and I woke up three days later with a broken femur, bruised face and arms. But because I was wearing my seatbelt, I survived. I was able to return to work to raise my son, who will graduate from college in May, and now enjoy a full life with my family. We know that seatbelts save lives. We know that primary seatbelt laws increase seatbelt use, and we know that increased seatbelt use prevents injuries and saves lives. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of this committee, the bill before you is an opportunity to do the right thing. It would be a measurable, life-saving, historic legacy that you could leave for yourselves, your loved ones, and the people of New Hampshire. On behalf of the NTSB, I urge you to vote favorably for House Bill 1258. And I can answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. I, uh, uh, thank you for taking the question. I asked earlier, there was funds available in the past trying to entice the states. It seems like 49 states fit the apple except for New Hampshire. Those funds still available for New Hampshire if we should decide? Their funds are still available, not, not the incentive grants that were once um, available back in the early 2000s, but if you pass a primary bill um, and you achieve an 85% seatbelt use rate, um, then uh, the funds would be available to use for highway improvements, uh, education campaigns, and that sort of thing, yes. Follow up if I may. 
Uh, how much money did New Hampshire lose in not being aggressive in chasing that particular grant? I, I don't I don't know that um, I'm with NTSB so it's uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is who determines that and manages those funds. I'm not sure, um, but it can often be in the millions of dollars that states are losing by not passing the law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am, for taking my question. If we didn't pass the law, but through education and other ways we were able to get to that 85 percent is that same money there or is it tied strictly to having that a seatbelt law in the state it is tied to a primary a primary seatbelt law i know that there are other funds available to states to do education campaigns i'm not sure what the um, what the restrictions or the requirements are for that sort of thing very quick follow up so there's no federal money for reaching a particular percentage of usage unless it's tied so in other words is, is no other federal money available if we got the right to a higher rate of usage? That I'm not sure. Okay. That I'm not sure of. Okay. Thank you. And we're only about double the allotted time, so the next speaker will be the last person for the morning session after that. Excuse me. The hearing will be recessed until 3 p.m. today. Chris O'Connell? <clears throat> Chairman Smith, members of the committee, my name is uh, Chris O'Connell, and I'm going to read a letter that I read to or uh, sent to uh, Representative Mulligan, the sponsor of the bill. My name is Chris O'Connell. I'm a resident of Enfield, New Hampshire, and I work at Dartmouth Hitchcock in Lebanon, New Hampshire. I'm writing to support House Bill 1259 relative to passenger restraints. I have been a nurse for 36 years and have worked most of that time in ICUs, emergency departments, and for the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Advanced Response Team at DART. I am currently working as a trauma program manager for Dartmouth-Hitchcock. From a professional perspective, I could tell you many stories where seatbelts have made a difference in either saving a person's life or preventing lifelong complications from injuries. But I would like to share a personal story instead. In 1984, I was traveling with my girlfriend, Marcia, to return her to college after the Christmas break. On the afternoon of January 8th, while driving on a snowy highway, another car lost control, slid across the median strip, and struck the car we were driving in head on. The collision occurred at highway speeds greater than 50 miles an hour, impacting the front and driver's side. Our car was pushed onto the driver's side and, and into the guardrail. It quickly caught fire, and thankfully a trucker stopped to put the fire out with his own fire extinguisher. I was driving, and nearly all the damage occurred on my side of the car. I was severely injured, many broken bones, head injury, among others. I was extricated from the vehicle after about an hour of being entrapped and was brought to a local trauma center. I spent the next few months hospitalized, recovering from my injuries, in nearly two years of rehabilitation and follow-up surgeries. I was wearing my seatbelt. That is the only reason I'm alive. In fact, one of the vivid memories I have is when one of the firefighters who rescued me kept on telling me good job repeatedly for wearing my seatbelt as the snow pelted my face while they worked to remove me from the car. I recovered. I finished school. I became a nurse with a master's degree. I joined the military. I served in both the Air Force and the Army. I have been deployed four times to the Middle East. I have earned the rank of Colonel. I have married. In fact, we just celebrated 28 years of marriage last week. I have raised three children to adulthood. I have been a son, a brother, a friend, a father, a teacher, a leader, a husband, a companion. I have seen and achieved a million wonderful things in my life because I was wearing my seatbelt. Marsha, my girlfriend, was not wearing her seatbelt, and she died at the scene. She was 21. She wanted to live. She had her whole life ahead of her, and the loss and the waste still haunt me today. I did ask her often to wear her seatbelt, but she offered the same excuses that many people do. It's uncomfortable. It's unnecessary. 
She also trusted me to drive safe. All those reasons are beyond an empty and hollow now. There was no seatbelt law to add any emphasis to my request for Marsha to wear her seatbelt. Had there been, I might have been able to save her life or encourage her to wear it. You know, her parents called me a few times after the accident. They lived in Minnesota while I was recovering, and it was the hardest conversation I've ever had. From my hospital bed, I told them through tears how sorry I was that their beautiful youngest daughter was dead and how I tried to get her to wear her seatbelt, but she wouldn't. They understood, they were kind, but nothing, nothing could take away the fact that she was killed not six inches from me because of a perceived inconvenience. Seatbelts save lives. I am living proof. Not wearing seatbelts can cost lives and futures and more than anyone can ever imagine. I hope this helps get this bill passed. Thank you. All right. Excuse me a second. Um, some, some people here have taken, you know, like myself, I played Houdini to get a few hours off of work to come up here. It's three o'clock later on stuff. You know, the seatbelt law is a big issue. It's always been a big issue. It's always taken hours. I've been involved for years. It's always taken hours. And to just cut people short and say, oh, come back, when they have to go to work, I don't believe is correct. On behalf of those who took more time than they asked for, I apologize. We also have people that have done exactly what you said for the next hearing, and it is likewise not fair to make them late. You're right, what I should have done was gaveled everybody the minute they exceeded their time. I was kind of hoping they'd self-manage and they failed. I'm not saying you did anything wrong. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I noticed on the website that two meetings were scheduled for 10 o'clock. Two. And I said, wow, how are they going to pull that off? I didn't know. I've only okay, scheduled here, one for 10 o'clock. I'm wasting time. Can I just speak and then go to work? Can't we all just speak? Yeah, we all can just speak. <laughs> Correct. We all can just speak. You all get, and so will you explain to the folks that come in for the next hearing why they can? That's no. the issue. But but we put. We can you get done in two hearings minutes? Hearings I'll let you go because here. you have to go I'm to not, work. I'm but not everybody not is not going to go, and that's just how it is. So can you do it in two minutes? I can do it in two minutes. You can go in two minutes and then we are done. I can do it in two minutes. Thank you very much. My name's Roger Ritchie. And by the way, I agree to that because everybody else that's on here has an organization with them. So, I'm, I'm, my, I'm sorry. My name is Roger Ritchie. I oppose this bill. I'm a native of New Hampshire, born 1962, 55 years ago. I've lived in the state for 51 years. I did four years Army. Okay, it's the only time I left the state. I love our state. Our state is unique, the New Hampshire advantage. Um, I go around the country, yeah, I have to wear my seatbelt, and I do not like wearing a seatbelt. I just feel uncomfortable, and I think my safety depends on my comfortability. I tell people, well, yeah, we don't have an income tax, a sales tax, a helmet law, a seatbelt law. They say, there's a place like that that exists? There is. We're the only state out of 50 states and Canada with the only little beacon of light left of that individual liberty. And it is individual liberty. And li liberty definition is the right to choose. Um, I do believe that the Constitution, the state Constitution, is very important here. Article 2 gives us the right of liberty, the right to choose. Article 3 is very important, okay? And I think I'm going to write, read it and then I'm going to break it down, my opinion. When men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. And without such equivalent, the surrender is void, 1784. We all know that we give up the right of freedom of speech in the movie theater. We cannot yell fire because others will get trampled, die, and get hurt. But me wearing my seatbelt or not in my car traveling by myself depends on me not others. So the surrender is void automatically. I talked to constitutional lawyers about this. I got my opinion and their opinion, but I believe, I hope everybody checks into this because this is over all of our arguments. The video here, very sad, very, very sad. Okay. But that wasn't New Hampshire. They have laws. It still happened. It still happened. That was New Hampshire. Um, I also am just a subject here, okay? I work for the post office. I cannot run and be your peer. I cannot sit up there. 
So I come here, and I've been coming here since they started the ones for the child, the children. I said no then. I was called a child hater. The reason why I said no is called incrementalism. They will be going up and up and up and knocking on my door. They went from 6 to 12 to 18, now you're knocking on my door. They told me I thought too much. You think too much? No, we're just thinking about the children. No, it's called incrementalism and it happens. It's human nature. I think we have reduced seatbelt. We've increased seatbelt usage and the lady, that was, she was right. People do not know that there's no seatbelt law here. So they wear them. People wear them. We have a lot of people that wear them. And I don't, don't care if they wear them or not. I am just an individual. I like to be free. And I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir? Thank you. I'm not as loud. Well. on this bill on February 27th. If you can't come back at 3, feel free to send your written testimony to the committee. We're in recess till 3 p.m. On this hearing, just on this very next step. Can I pass this on? Yeah. Is that it? Um, as soon as we get the room sorted out, we'll move on to 1262.